Correct. Thank you. Are we, are we good to go? Are you all set, Ken? We're ready. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the time. I, I think what I'll, I'll do is, um, I know it's a, a little awkward uh, doing things like this. You guys are getting a lot more used to it than probably even I am. Um, and I don't want to be repetitive. I, I hope everyone had, at least had a chance to look at the initial budget presentation that we did. And again, you know, one of the hard parts about doing it virtually is that, you know, you're not there with, you know, really presenting it on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the house. But what we also tried to do is show some charts and graphs um, because it really is uh, talking about a budget without showing any numbers is always a very challenging thing. So in some ways, it created an opportunity uh, to show some of the things we wanted to highlight and give a little historical perspective on some of these numbers and, and, and some of the dynamics that we're talking about. So um, if you'll bear with me, I'm happy to go through a few of these things. And then there's a few other things that we didn't quite get to in the initial budget presentation, but are I think, worthwhile and, note, and uh, worth noting uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, but what we really tried to do in the initial presentation was really hit all those high points, all those things that, uh, for the most part, I, we think can have the biggest impact, positive impact on people's lives, where we are and the opportunities uh, as we move forward. So um, if you'll bear with me, um, obviously, let's just start with, with where we were. And, and I don't, you don't need the governor to explain to you the, the really the, all the challenges and the pitfalls of, of the last year. Um, they go well beyond just the economic impacts. They go to our communities and, and society. Um, without a doubt. One of the first things we did, you know, knowing how severe this was going to be back in March and April of last year, uh, we knew that it was going to have a huge economic impact, uh, whether it was just for a few weeks, a few months, or even potentially longer. Um, so when the economic impacts of the pandem pandemic really undercut what at the time was uh, one of the strongest economies in the state's history, um, we did take very decisive action. Uh, we faced a lot of uncertainty, and that can be very scary, uh, but it also means you have to step up and, and make some very tough decisions. Uh, the budget shortfall that we looked at uh, was predicted, working with the Department of Revenue, was pre predicted at anywhere between $350 and $400 million. Um, by taking some the actions of both managing expenses, uh, instilling a, a hiring freeze, um, just being, I think, tight on a lot of things. We even uh, pushed out a few of the capital projects, not because even if the ones we didn't want to push out because there were no workers. People didn't, you know, it was hard to get folks to actually keep committing to those projects because there was such an unknown future. But that also created the opportunity to not have to expend that cash until we really got a handle on what was going to happen with our economy. And we, we were able over time to really reduce that, that hole, if you will, to about a $50 million dollar uh, shortfall, not a $350 million shortfall, which is obviously a, a lot more manageable in, in a variety of different ways. Um, the end education trust fund, which again, no one has, was really sure where that was going to end up, but now it's projected to end the biennium with a positive balance. Uh, the longstanding uh, highway fund deficit has been substantially reduced. Um, and the fishing game, uh, we saw a lot of more people hunting and fishing and getting their license and recreating. They were spending their they're, uh, either they're, but they were bringing home and pay. They wanted to be outside and be healthy. Um, a lot of folks were getting unemployment checks or whatever it was, the unemployment stipend, and they wanted to spend it in a way that they could spend time with their families outdoors, and that has really boosted um, the Fish and Game Fund to really levels we haven't seen in, in many, many years. Um, and all that you know, created opportunity um, for us. So putting all that opportunity in terms of what we were managing through 2020 together, allowed us to create a, a balanced budget. And that's the most important thing. It's truly balanced within itself. Um, we don't use a cent of any sort of speculative federal money, not a penny of money that hasn't been voted on or spent or authorized out of the federal government. This budget relies on not a penny of that. I know there's a lot of talk about that out there, but it's, it's not even an exaggeration. It's 100% untrue. So uh, we really have a budget that lives within its own means. Uh, it cuts taxes, as a lot of folks have heard and, and know. It increases the municipal revenue sharing. Uh, we always talk about the fact that the state cannot control directly property taxes, but what we can do is send back cash and send back opportunity that would help offset otherwise local costs. And so this budget, I think, does a couple of very creative things in terms of allowing us to, to do uh, more municipal revenue sharing and also help hopefully make and maintain that obligation of more municipal revenue sharing uh, for the long term. Um, it, da it downshifts um, nothing. It really, in terms of burden, in terms of cost to those municipalities, um, we also include $30 million 
in one-time aid to schools for capital investments, infrastructure, energy efficiency projects, whatever the schools want. We're really building on that school infrastructure fund that we created a couple years ago, specifically at the time for safe school infrastructure, and we put a lot of money into that. Um, we're, we're keeping that same fund, but we're just broadening the ability of local school districts to use these uh, state matching grants uh, for whatever they, they want in terms of capital projects, that, that one-time spending, uh, which again really takes the burden off some of the local districts, allows districts to do projects that they otherwise uh, weren't able to do in the past. Um, we talk a lot about the tax uh, uh, relief, and, and that's a big one for me because when I've spent a lot of time with businesses over the past year, they all want the opportunity to bring workers back in. They all want the opportunity to reinvest in capital, reinvest in equipment, whatever it might be, and, and really every dollar helps. So what we tried to do is not just create tax relief for businesses, but for everyone. Um, and, and I really wanted to make sure that we were covering the entire spectrum there. So um, it doesn't create any new taxes. That's another one. It's not just that we've cut taxes. Sometimes you've seen people cut taxes over here, but they raise taxes over there. This does none of that. No new taxes or fees, no increases in taxes or fees. Um, and it doesn't play any sort of political games. There's nothing buried in here. There's nothing hidden in here. What we tried to do is write it very simply, very upfront um, and, and transparent. If anything, we've, we've tried to be very transparent about everything we do uh, over the last year. Um, so first with the meals and rooms tax, a lot of folks have been talking about this. Uh, my budget reduces the meals and rooms tax from 9% down to 8.5%. Um, and that just helps folks either take a, a, a people want to go out to, to get a meal. It takes a little bit off that bill. It takes a little bit of the burden off the business. Um, it, it allows everybody to, to uh, benefit in that. And hopefully we can you know, continue some of those reductions in, in future budgets and future years. It obviously helps small businesses by reducing the business enterprise tax from 0.6% down to 0.55%. Um, and then the big one that on the business enterprise tax is really increasing that filing threshold. Moving the filing threshold up to $250,000 will effectively take tens of thousands of businesses, maybe even up to 30, 35,000 businesses, won't even have to file that tax anymore. That's a, that's a savings for the state, that's a savings for that business. Uh, the, net of, the net impact of that is a, is a few million dollars, so we can manage around that. But just the ability to take so many of those small businesses, those entrepreneur businesses that are already laced with too much regula regulation and paperwork, getting them off of that and, and really allowing them to do what they should be doing is focusing on their business instead of worrying about paying the state taxes. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity for small businesses in the state. And then I think the big one is, is a tax that has been talked about, we've been talking about getting rid of it for literally 50 years in this state, and that's the interest and dividends tax. Um, it, it, we, we take it in, I think in 2023, we go it from five down to 4%, and then the idea is that we can gradually reduce that, phase that to zero, and really give seniors, retirees, they're the ones that just benefit. That is just cash in their pockets to reinvest, whether it's in their families or their communities, or give them a little more flexibility to stay in this state. Um, you know, we don't want people to be running down to Florida. We don't want people to be running down and retiring in other states. We want them retiring and, and creating opportunity here. People are living longer. They're retiring for a longer amount of time. And so the more opportunity we create for those seniors and retirees to keep that money in their pockets, we become a magnet, not just for small businesses and young families, which we're already doing a phenomenal job with, but we're, we're also providing that opportunity on the other end of the spectrum um, that, again, those are dollars that are going to be reinvested right back into our, our economy. Education funding, always a, a hot topic. Um, you know, we're projected to end this biennium with a positive balance of more than $50 million in the Education Trust Fund. Uh, and the strength of that really means that you know, if more students were to return back to public schools, we know that a lot of students left public schools. They took other options as schools were closing or, or, or finding their own models. We're assuming a, a good amount of those students come back. But even if more come back into the model, we have a cushion there. We have flexibility uh, to make sure that the state can meet its financial obligation uh, for students coming back in. Um, it spends more money per student. Um, in the biennium than ever before. It's a very important one. If you look at the dollars we're spending per student, uh, we broke the record in the last budget uh, that I proposed, and we're breaking the record yet again in this budget. So more dollars per student than ever before. And then for those, I know there's a lot of municipalities, and I know a lot of representatives have probably heard from their, their superintendents about this free and reduced lunch issue. 
And, and basically we clean that up is what we do. You know, because folks didn't have to go through the traditional paperwork and, and regulatory barriers to get their free and reduced lunch, we really made it, the, through the federal government, we made it very available to everyone. That was great. Um, but because of that, um, there's less people actually technically applying for free, free and reduced lunch. So we know the need is there, but it's hard to figure out who's applying. And, and what that does is that really messes with really the, the formula that we use to grant adequacy back to cities and towns. This budget cleans all of that up. Really, we move on to kind of a, a better system so that um, if that issue were to persist, we, we don't have a, a short change. We're not shortchanging cities and towns in terms of what we'd be giving them. And that's, I know that's been a very a big issue for Manchester and especially a lot of the larger cities that have a lot of students on free and reduced lunch. And the whole point of this budget is we clean that up, we fix our formula, and we make sure, again, we're, we're meeting that obligation for our students. We're meeting that adequacy uh, as it comes to education funding. Um, so when you add that up, or I should say even over and above that, we're also allowing for up to $15 million in additional revenue sharing now. So we have um, uh, through municipalities over the biennium. So when you add all the revenue sharing opportunities up, uh, it totals as much as $78 million uh, by fiscal year 2023 in revenue sharing. So it's $78 million back to cities and towns uh, over and above the operations of the state, which again is, is all just about uh, allowing them to... Uh, kind of offshift, offshift a little bit what the locally, local property taxpayers would have, would have traditionally been paying. We can pick up some of that cost um, for them. You know, another thing I didn't get a chance to, we didn't, we didn't talk about in the presentation that, that we did, but uh, an important thing that my budget is also looking to do is create some changes with the unemployment trust fund. Um, you know, when, when, when we hit 17% unemployment very, very quickly, uh, the federal government stepped up and they helped us with a lot of the unemployment opportunity, but our, our own fund took its own hit. Um, I think most states in the country uh, have, have, are actually in the process of borrowing money from the federal government just to keep their unemployment trust fund solvent. We never had to do that. We managed very, very well, and Commissioner Kapatis and, and um, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Lavers deserve a lot of the credit for that. They did a phenomenal job with our unemployment trust fund. The level of abuse and waste and fraud was really, really minimal here. It might be even one of the lowest in the country. We're not sure, but we think we're the best in the country. Um, while other states were literally wasting hundreds of millions of dollars, we became very efficient with it. Now that created the opportunity of us not having to borrow from the federal government. We invested CARES Act money, one of the few states that invested uh, a substantial amount of CARES Act money, about 50 million I put in to the unemployment trust fund as well. And so what my budget is really proposing to do, the changes to the trust fund, is to strategically build the trust during strong economic times to reduce that financial burden on businesses during the downturns. Um, so what it, what it really does is, as our trust fund drops, we typically hit businesses with addition, an additional tax and an, and, an, and an additional surcharge. And what we do is we move those threshold levels and we get rid of the surcharge. Think about it. As the trust fund drops, that's happening in tough economic times, and we're actually increasing taxes on businesses while they're struggling the most. So it doesn't really make much sense. So we're trying to really change that model, and just by moving some of the thresholds and being able, that allows us to remove those surcharges and still maintain a very healthy trust fund. And I know uh, both Matt Malo and um, uh, and Deputy Commissioner Labors will talk a lot more about that in detail. But it's a real opportunity to kind of modernize. You know, this crisis allowed us uh, to really look at our system in depth, see how it works in, in, in levels of very high stress, and I think come back with some very proactive ideas uh, about just how to make it more viable for the future. Um, strengthening the rainy day fund. I, I just, I'm a huge believer in saving. I really am. And, and you know, I don't want to say that we just got lucky. We really managed very, very well. But there's a lot of states who just had to drain every bit of their rainy day fund down uh, during this economic crisis. Luckily, we didn't have to do that. But we effectively have a cap on our rainy day fund. I just fundamentally disagree with putting a cap on any sort of savings account. So this budget also proposes moving that threshold um, to, uh, to hit a 10% of the revenue raised over the biennium. It effectively doubles the amount we could put in the rainy day fund to ballpark $300 million. Um, when it rains, it pours. And, and again, we hope we never have to have another pandemic like this, but without a doubt, um, you know, capping the rainy day fund is, from, from a, a long-term strategy, a strategic point of view, can be a very risky thing and potentially risk higher taxes and increased fees and surcharges and all of this in the future um, if we're having to 
create new taxes just to fill in budgetary holes that could have been done by just uh, you know saving a little better uh, in the short term. Uh, I talk a lot about student debt assistance. Um, you know, when we talk about re, you know rebuilding our economy, we know businesses they're already coming here, which is great. They're, they want to expand here, but the limitation that businesses have is, is twofold: number one, workforce; number two, housing. And those are very directly connected. Now, I have a, a housing bill that I we put a bipartisan housing bill uh, forward. A lot of folks, in Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate, are charging forward with that. I think it's a great bill, and it really creates incentives, not penalties, but incentives for local communities to make those investments uh, in, in housing. Uh, if you don't have the housing, you can't. You, if the people, if, if the workers that you need for a business to go from a thousand employees to thirteen hundred employees, if they literally have no place to live, the workers can't come. And so if you want to be pro-business, if you want to support local businesses, big and small, you have to find a way to create housing in New Hampshire. And we're not coming in with a, uh, a, a hammer saying, you know, we're going to take over the housing permitting process and all the localities. Absolutely not. Local control must be respected. Um, it really what separates us. But at the same time, um, that does come with the responsibility of moving forward on a local level with a lot of the housing opportunities. The other piece there is student debt assistance. We know we're one of the highest, uh, when it comes to states in the country with students with some of the highest debt load, it's right here in New Hampshire. Now we create a lot of economic opportunity. We're one of the wealthier states in the country. We have some of the highest wages, but our students still have a lot of debt load. Um, so I'm reproposing what I proposed in the last budget, which is using the fees that are collected off our 529 plan, not taxes, but the fees as folks all across the country buy our 529 plan, um, and we have one of the best 529 plans uh, programs in the country, which is why, we're, why we really collect more fees than we've ever imagined. Instead of just dumping that into these college endowments that just sit there, we're going to take those dollars and reinvest them into student debt assistance. And if you stay and work here in New Hampshire, we'll help pay down your student debt. It helps retain workforce. It helps lower the student debt. It's not just fr this free college nonsense that's being discussed down in Washington. Um, where, again, it absolves people of re the responsibility, where essentially, if you think of it, buying those workers, we're incentivizing those workers to stay and work and hopefully raise their families right here in New Hampshire, and that encourages more businesses to come. They can take advantage of that opportunity and help set us apart from everyone else in the Northeast. So it's those types of things that can set us apart and set us on a very, very positive economic path in terms of economic growth, encouraging businesses to come in, and most importantly, encouraging that next generation of workforce to live, work, and play right here in New Hampshire. Um, we talk a lot about paid leave, voluntary paid leave. It, it has to happen. There's no reason why paid leave should not be happening here in New Hampshire, and the voluntary plan we put forward is very simple. It's been backed by literally a dozen different uh, businesses uh, have looked at this model across the country, said they want to be part of it. It makes sure that the state doesn't become the insurance company, as the old plan does. It allows real insurance companies to take on the financial risk, to be the actuarials, and simply by providing paid leave for all of the state employees, 10,000 of them, the premiums drop to rock bottom levels and you allow all the other businesses across the state to participate in that program with very low premiums if they choose, and employees if they choose. It's just up to them. Um, by, by, it really is founded in this idea that we're going to create very low premiums at the state level by, by providing the program for all of our state employees, and then everybody gets to benefit from that. Everyone gets to enjoy those low premium benefits on a voluntary basis. You don't have to mandate it. You don't have to force anybody in. It stays economically viable. That's been proven and tried and true through all the actuarials. Uh, and that's the real opportunity that I think a lot of us um, have in, in when we talk about the gold standard, doing paid leave the right way. Uh, law enforcement accountability. This is another issue that I know a lot of you will, will be taking up. Um, the the LEAC Commission came out with, uh, I think, 48 different recommendations, many of which we were able to do through executive order. Some are passing through and being discussed in, in the legislative bodies now. Um, and they all passed unanimously, which was tremendous. But there are some programs there that also need a little bit of funding, whether it's um, you know, making sure police standards and training have what they have. And I got to tell you, I, if you have the chance, spend some time with John Skippa, who is now the new director at Police Standards and Training. He's phenomenal. Uh, he's, he's the right thinker, the right way, the right approach, great customer mentality, great connection with all local law enforcement. Um, and you know, he's really driving the boat on a lot of this, and he's just done a phenomenal job. 
So we make sure that we're funding those programs and those opportunities. It could be um, uh, cameras uh, for our state police. It could be the million dollar matching dollars that we've put in for your local governments. If your local police want to do cameras or dashboard cams, we'll help provide matching grants for that, which I think is a tremendous opportunity to making sure we're not just saying we're going to be accountable in Concord, but really making sure this is a community effort up and down uh, New Hampshire from, from Canada to Massachusetts, from Maine to Vermont. Um, here in the 603, every community needs to be part of that solution. Doesn't mean we're going to agree on every last detail. Of course, there's a lot of hashing out the legislature is going to have to work on. But the, I think the vast majority of where we know this needs to go, we're all on the same boat on this. And providing some of the funds to make that a reality, not just talk about it, but really make it a reality, uh, is really a priority of the administration and, and is, is built into the budget in a balanced way. Um, a few more things. I know I'm going kind of fast. I want to get to questions, so just bear with me. Um, the community college and the university system merger. Everyone's been talking about that a bit. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's very simple. It's actually very, very complex. But the process we're going to start is very simple, and that's bringing the boards together. So bringing a few members of the university board, a few members of the community college board, and simply saying that if we're going to have everyone just live in their same old silos, going about it the same old way, we're going to get left behind. There's, that's not a debate. That is an absolute fact. And it's not being left behind 10 years from now. It's being left behind like two and three years from now. Um, this is a nonpartisan, bipartisan effort. There's absolutely no politics involved here, which is very good. That kind of removes that bad variable from the equation, if you will. And simply says, how do we make it a streamlined process for our students, for our faculty, um, how do we challenge ourselves to uh, look at how, how do we challenge ourselves to look at how we ask students to pay, right? Maybe there's different payment plans that we can we can create this, different opportunities, different opportunities for research and development projects for students that otherwise would have never been able to, to be exposed to that, different opportunities for the four-year college student to actually have more hands-on learning that is provided in the community college, which is more necessary than ever now for a viable workforce. So. And, and, and really raising up, I mean, let's face it, the community college system is phenomenal in New Hampshire. It is phenomenal. But it, it sometimes is treated as a second tier system. It's not. It's not. Those students, those faculty, they are just as viable, if not more so with some of their skills, than a lot of the opportunities we're creating just in the university system. And so now bringing everyone together on an even par, not one over the other, but a true partnership and allowing them to help figure out some of these details, I think is the opportunity we, we just, I don't think it's a question. We, we, have, to, we have to allow that to happen. And not, it'll save us some money. It might cost us a little money in the short term. Maybe it saves us some money in the long term. This isn't just about a budgetary move by any means. This is about a modern 21st century education system that is streamlined, that's seamless. Do you know our system has hundreds of agreements within it? that says these credits in this class can transfer to these credits with this university and these credits in this university transfer to these credits over here. It, there's literally hundreds of agreements that are floating around there on the back end. It's so convoluted. Why not have a single system, a single process? Make it seamless on the back end, seamless on the front end, raise everybody to a level where they are picking their path in higher education and we're not just you know, trying to cram them into the, the old fashioned silos. Um, so a lot of a lot of opportunity there. Um, I talked about the Department of Energy, and I'm going to bring that up because I know a lot of folks in the House have been asking about it. Um, right now, we have our Public Utility Commission. There are essentially our judges that will uh, debate and adjudicate on rates and things of that nature, but at the same time, manage a department that's also managing policy. It's a massive conflict of interest. And again, no politics involved here. Folks on both sides of the aisle, I think, are, are thrilled that we're finally separating those two parts. You know, they'll be connected administratively, but let the judges do the judging and let the department do the departmenting, if you will. And, uh, and by separating those two, I think you're just going to create a, a lot of opportunity because the conflict of interest start really disappearing. Um, and so that's really what that's about. It's just taking a, a system that is, has grown big and it's, it's a very important system, but mixing having judges be managers of a department managing policy that they have to then adjudicate on just doesn't make any sense, and, and, and you get a lot of recusals and all of this sort of thing. So that's more of a, a simplification of the process, and I think it's been received very, very well so far. Um, let's talk a little bit about health and human services. So um, 
a couple things. We modernized a lot of the IT infrastructure in health and human services in this budget, which I think is, is a huge opportunity. Um, there's long-term structural investments there. We keep our commitments. We increase funding for the DD community. Uh, we keep our com commitments to DCYF that has been doing a phenomenal job. I showed on the chart uh, in the, my budget, budget presentation that we're the number of cases of, of cases per worker when I first became governor was 80, 90, uh, close to 90 per worker. And we've gotten that down to about a dozen, very manageable level. And we still have vacancies, which is great. So we can still fill those vacancies, um, but we create efficiencies within those, those systems and just get the, the product out, which is better, better services for those kids, better attention, one-on-one -on -one attention for those kids and those families. That's what's going to get better results. And whether it's talking about saving money in the long run or just getting these kids on a better path, it's all a win. And so those investments have already started paying off huge dividends. Um, you know, we talked about the Medicaid rate increases, a very contentious part of the last budget. We said we'd raise the rate 3.1% and then 3.1%. We're not going back on that commitment. A lot of folks said we should. I won't do it. I think we have to maintain that commitment. I I'm a big believer in promises made or promises kept. And so keeping that 3.1% increase uh, for the full biennium and moving forward uh, is very important. Um, we, this budget also does things, just uh, a couple last minute things and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for questions, but uh, we kind of modernized the adult parole board. Uh, we've had some issues with the adult parole board in, in a variety of fashion. And so what we do is we kind of just rebuild it, remodernize it, reorganize it, if you will. Um, uh, we digitize the board's day-to-day -day operations. We definitely save a lot of money and efficiency in doing that. Um, you know, what, I'm a big believer also in unif unifying our dispatching function. So, you know, Fish and Game has a dispatching center over there. For a while, Marine Patrol had a dispatching center over there. Safety had a dispatching center over there. We brought Marine Patrol in to, to safety a few years ago, and it's worked very, very well. Uh, one of the outliers right now is Fish and Game, so we're going to bring them back in as well and make sure it's a unified system because at the end of the day, when it comes to health and safety, in this state at least, it's all hands on deck. It's not about silos. Local works very, very well with, with state and federal partners. Um, they work uh, from town to town and county to county. We're, we're very, we do it really, really well in terms of the seamless communication of safety, but we still have this, this for whatever reason, fish and game was never, dispatch was never included. I think we just need to include it. And now um, something else you'll see, not so much in this budget, but we're already moving forward with, is called Mutual Link, which links up hospitals to our dispatching centers, schools to our dispatch centers, dispatching centers. So it really is a seamless communication protocol up and down. And again, we just want to make sure everybody uh, is part of those opportunities. So again, you know, I'll, I'll kind of back up and leave it there. I, you guys know the budget a lot better than I do in many, many ways. Um, I, I just want to reiterate, this budget is balanced within itself. I've just heard some of this talk that we are counting on additional federal assistance. Zero. Not a penny of additional federal assistance is needed to balance this budget. Uh, that would be a very irresponsible thing to do, right? We may get other federal assistance, and that'll be great, and we'll deal with that when it comes. It'll likely be one-time money for one-time projects. You would never want to use that in operational costs anyways, and we count on none of that, not for our capital budgets, uh, none of it. Now, if it comes, the legislature will have a, a big hand in terms of how those dollars are spent and making sure that we can spend it very, very well, but that has nothing to do with this budget. I just want to be, be very, very clear on that. Um, and I think whatever, whatever changes are made and however the legislature decides to go, I'm a big believer that the opportunity to spend any of our extra money, any of the savings we're able to achieve through this process, sending it back to cities and towns, offshooting, offsetting some of those costs that they bear, it's such an important part of this. Um, increasing that room, that, that, you know, moving the rooms and meals threshold, not just lowering the tax, but by moving the threshold and getting closer to the commitment that we made to cities and towns years ago, putting another $15 million in that rooms and meals commitment is an absolute huge step. Um, every year we pass a budget that suspends that, right? We gotta move beyond that. And so we kind of move that. We don't quite get there this year, but over time I think we can, but we get closer to that. And again, it's all just cash that goes back to those cities and towns that they've never, that they've ne never been able to have before. While at the same time, having a room and meals tax cut. I mean, think about it. We're cutting the room and meals tax and sending 15 million more back to cities and towns. That's a huge win, a huge win. And we still have a balanced budget. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I know you, know, you folks have, have dealt with this a lot more than I have. You've, you've looked at these numbers in many ways a, a lot more than I have. And the, your constituents will be very active, I'm sure, in, in pushing different, different things. But um, I just think that there's great opportunity here. We're in a great economic 
times and, and um, you know, as we come out of this much better than we ever thought. I think the, this summer is going to be absolutely phenomenal with travel, tourism, room and meals, all of it is going to really be booming. And so, you know, we don't want a budget process to hold us up there. We want the budget process to create opportunity there so we can maximize it for the citizens of the state. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll be quiet and we can take some questions, whether Lisa and, and, and Matt and the whole team are here for you, whatever you need. And, and again, please understand, we'll answer everything we can here, but if there's certain details we can't answer, we'll, we'll, just, we'll put a package together with all the questions and be sure to send something uh, over to the committee as soon as we can with any of the details that you're looking for. Thank you very much, Governor. So you want us to hold the, the uh, questions for Matt? No. All right. Uh, uh, no, I mean, Matt's here. Uh, Matt, are you on? Uh, I am on. I'm not on video, so they, they can't see me, unfortunately. Right. But I am, I am here, Mr. Chairman, and happy to respond to anything that you might have. All right. I see uh, questions on the screen from the people at home, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Representative Heath for a question for the governor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Governor, for taking my question. Um, my question is relative, you know me in education and my love of the university system, the unique system. And, and I see that you have taken away the endowment fund portion that goes um, to the schools. Right now, this is one of the most difficult times for our colleges and universities. Do you really think this is a good time to take that away? Uh, what have they ever used that endowment fund for? Well, right for things like right now, um, they they you're right. They have put it aside and and they've saved it for things that they need. Um, but right now is is one of those times. I think they're all under extreme duress, um, and it just they are very concerned about it. Yeah, so uh, I understand that the endowment funds are all limited. They cannot be used for operational costs. They all have those restrictions. So we're providing a lot of capital. For example, we put a, a we're um, two things. Let's go to the university system in particular. They asked for a lot of money for the state over three bienniums to do their bio life sciences building. I committed to that. I did it. We did a portion last year. We're doing a portion this year. We're not backing out of that commitment. I've put, put money in last time to double the number of nurses uh, out of UNH, which I had to fight to get back in. I know folks wanted to take that out. I fought to get it back in. So we're making those capital investments for them. Um, the capital in terms of the university system is, is fairly healthy right now. Um, the most important thing is that we're investing the money into students. We need workers. Students need to be living off that. And that, that endowment, that extra money that goes into the endowment is more than we ever anticipated. If we weren't meeting certain commitments with the endowment, I get it. But this is money over and above what was ever projected to go into the system in the first place, and it's tax-free. So I just think it's an opportunity. At some point, it's not about the system. It has to be about the students and the workforce coming in. And so, yeah, I know they're under a lot of pressure, to be sure. But I think that's one of the opportunities in bringing the two systems together at the same time, right? Allowing the community college and the entire university system to create those synergies, um, effectively expanding their, their, their physical space, their opportunity for students. All that will come into play in terms of how the, you know, where the endowment goes. But I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I was always shocked with the restrictions that the endowment is self-imposed upon itself, it can't be used for their everyday costs, unfortunately. Thank you, Governor. Next question comes from Representative Walner. Thank you. Um, thank you, Governor, and thank you, uh, Chairman Weiler. I, I have a couple of questions, if that's all right. The first one's gonna be, a, is sort of a maybe a simple question, but maybe the hardest question to answer. And that is, we're still waiting on House Bill 2. And I'm wondering uh, when we might see that. And um, it's very hard for the Finance Committee to proceed with um, their work on the budget until we have House Bill 2 available. So I'm just wondering what you think that, when you think that might be available. Sure. Uh, Matt, do you want to answer that? Absolutely. This is Matthew Malo. Uh, thank you, Representative, for the question. Uh, HB2 was delivered to the LBA uh, on the 15th as statutorily required. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are working through the logistics there. Uh, and it's our expectation that you'll see it uh, relatively soon. But at this point, um, it has been delivered. 
Th thank you. I mean, I think you understand because you've put this together. So I think you understand how important HB2 is to the work of the House as we proceed. Um, so Governor, I thought it was, I think it's interesting when you talk about um, the $300 million cap on the rainy day fund. And I think everyone would agree that um, a goal like that is, a, is an admirable goal. But then when I look on page nine of the executive budget summary, which is basically what I've got to work from, um, I see by the end of 2023, we'll be at about 85 million lower than we were at the end of 2020. And I wonder what kinds of projections you have around the rainy day fund um, and where we're going with it. Sure, um, I, don't, I don't really have any projections beyond this biennium. I think, you know, conceptually we've, we had to dig into it a little to make up that, that $50 million hole. Uh, we balanced the budget here. Um, I think what we want to look at is, you know, how do we grow it in the future? And even if it's 10 million here and 20 million there and 30 million there, it's just like putting money away for your Christmas account or whatever or whatever it might be. So again, you know, we're able to, to kind of stabilize our, our losses this, uh, I think, very well this time. But you know, where we go with that, I think that I'll leave that completely up to the legislature. But you know, my first two budgets, we always had the discussion if we wanted to increase the rainy day account. Well, we have a limit. Well, we have a limit. I just don't think we should have a limit. If we have really good economic times, let's put it in savings. Doesn't mean you can spend on infrastructure and capital projects too, of course, but there should always be the ability to put something in savings without saying, you know, we, we have a cap. So um, we don't make any additional projections beyond that, I don't think. Matt, do we? I don't think, because I don't think it'd be appropriate. I think we're just trying to get the economy back on track. You know, given all the extra money we had in the first two budgets after the first two bienniums that we, we went through here, um, that's an awesome opportunity. And it's always great to, we've, I think, been very smart about reinvesting that one-time money into one-time projects, but partially because, you know, there was always a limit on, on what we could save. And I, it's just about creating an, a flexibility for the legislature. I mean, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it, but it just gives the, the future legislatures a lot more flexibility to save. Great, thank you. I do have one more, if I could, if you don't mind, I, if you've got an extra minute. So my last question is, I, I know you've talked a lot about your um, tax reductions and it, it's a variety of different, different reductions, but I wonder if you had um, a total value of what those are worth in this budget. How much um, total dollars does this represent? It's a great, uh, great question. I'm going to look to Matt a little bit. I know we discussed that a couple weeks ago. Absolutely. And this will be uh, hashed out more uh, with ways and means tomorrow morning. But the proposed changes over the biennium amount to between 50 and $55 million. Um, there are a number of things in there, of course, with the various tax proposals that are included in this budget. Um, and we'll be happy to go into detail with the committee tomorrow morning. Uh, as they put together the revenue estimates based on current law and also um, what HB2 effectively uh, will put in place if it were to become law. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mary Jane. Representative Hatch for a question. Oh, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Governor, for the presentation and taking questions. Um, uh, Representative Walner addressed most of mine, but and again, without House Bill 2, it's kind of hard to wrap my head around what's occurring, but I, I'm just interested in, in the uh, anticipated increase in tax revenues um, aligned with the deductions in tax revenues. And just as an example, of course, in rooms and meals, we're gonna see a spike as compared to last year, but going back further than last year, um, I really don't see how those two correlate, and is there something in the House Bill too that will help me make sense out of this? Because um, I agree, I'm, I'm happy to see tax deductions, but um, I guess I look at it macroly as well as mi microly. And uh, rooms and meals, for an example, and these, these are comments from local businesses who have a great concern about their property taxes, which is a real problem up here um, for many of us. Berlin has the highest rate in the state. Um, how can we 
increase revenue sharing in rooms and meals um, with this deduction. And individually, the comment was simply this. If somebody buys a breakfast for $10 in one of my businesses, that gives them a nickel back, that half a percent. But in reality, it has a big impact on what's collected in a whole. So how are these going to match up and how's that going to happen? I don't know if that's a fair question at this point, but I, I'm, I'm just sure. really having a hard time getting my head around these two um, dynamics that are in place. Sure. And thank oh, you. Happy to address it. No, look, I'm the governor. Everything's a fair question. You, you give me whatever you got. Um, so you're absolutely correct. The room and meals tax is going to be one of the toughest ones to come back over the long term. And we're, we're, I'm still projecting that the, that, that overall revenue is still going to be lower than we've seen in previous years. It's going to take a little while for that to come back. I think we're going to have a great summer. I'm not saying we're going to necessarily be breaking rooms and meals records. But where we do make up for a lot of that on the state side is the business profits tax, the business enterprise tax, the real estate transfer tax, the cigarette tax, lottery, um, liquor, all of these pro uh, programs are doing really, I mean, record-breaking numbers this year. And so we're not assuming that they're going exponential by any means, but even if they just go up a couple percent or so from where we are this year, that creates a lot of the opportunity that offsets, I know, a lot of the concerns that folks have specifically around room and meal. So um, I think what we've tried to do is say, look, room and meals can affect a lot of uh, local cities and towns in terms of the opportunity we give them. You're right, reducing the tax a half a percent can be somewhat minimal, but I get, I'll tell you what, it's a heck of a lot better than going a half a percent in the other direction. And over years, we always justified, well, it's just a quarter percent here and a half a percent there. And next thing you know, we have one of the highest rooms and meals taxes around. And, and we need to be competitive with other states. Consumers do look at this as someone who used to be in this game of owning restaurants and hotels, I can tell you. People really do look at these, these opportunities in terms of um, it's, it might only be a nickel uh, off of the small bill, but when you add hotel rooms and, and a weekend away and all of that, that stuff, it really does add up. And so by sending this in the right direction and, and being able to take advantage of the strong business profit, business enterprise, real estate tax, all these other taxes that are doing well, that can help offset and create the opportunity for the cities and towns. Remember, most of the BET will go into education, right? And the rest of it, most of the BPT goes to kind of the general fund. But so those funds typically don't go back to cities and towns. Room and Meals does. So let's create the opportunity there and get that you know, flexibility back to the cities and towns. So it's, it's, it's an offset. You're absolutely right. I don't think those numbers are going to keep going up, but they don't have to because they're offset by the strength of the, the other strengths in our economy. Thank you, Governor. Representative Thank Ober you. for a question here in the chamber. Is that okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governor, thank you for meeting with us and having your staff available. You know, and I know we dig into this to find detail. So really what I wanna ask is if I send Mr. Kane several questions and ask him to send them over to your budget director, will you have him dig into them? For example, one of the questions I'm interested in is your new Department of Energy. Several years ago, I was part of the group that wrote the site evaluation RSA, and in hindsight, there are these unintended consequences I wish we hadn't done. And you've now moved the PUC, which controls that, into a new agency. So I'm kind of curious in HB2 if you handled some of those things. And I'll give you one example, because you did say adjudicative commissioners are moved to an administrative agency. We made a mistake and had the site evaluation committee actually do some of the follow-up and it's in the state law unfortunately that probably should have gone to des on the permitting and some of the certifications every now and then we talk about trying to do something well you're doing something so i'd like to work with matt and see if we got rid of some of those niggles and would you mind if we send in some written questions to your staff I would, I would love it. Again, look, you, you folks have been on the front lines of this, especially you, Lynn, and some others, a lot longer than we have. And, and that's a hugely valuable understanding because you've heard the direct testimony, you understand the pushes and pulls and what maybe has been tried and what hasn't. So no, your questions would be, I, I'm begging you for the questions because that helps us understand you know, where conceptually maybe we haven't, haven't planned it all the way out, but there's no doubt that we can make it a better system. And so yeah, send over whatever you want and we'll, we'll happy to work with you. That'd be fun. Thank you very much. Representative Lynn for a question in the chamber. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor. 
Um, I, I have to say, just in follow up to Representative Ober's question, I, I think the idea of the Department of Energy makes tremendous sense be, to, to separate the, the sort of adjudicatory uh, functions from the, from the management administration of the, uh, of the department. I, I, I'm wondering along the same lines when you talked about the, the parole, the changes you proposed for the parole board. My understanding is that and I think it's I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense. I saw that you're proposing to make the chair of the parole board a full time position, which I think makes makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm wondering, though, if my understanding is that the parole board right now also has some administrative kind of kinds of responsibilities, um, probably, probably nowhere near as great as the as the Public Utilities Commission does, but still has some. And I'm wondering if it would make sense to make a similar kind of change with the parole board, that is to let them have, let them have their adjudicative responsibility as the parole board, but perhaps put them, you know, more fully under the Department of Corrections uh, administratively, or maybe under the Department of Safety. But in other words, have somebody else do the sort of administrative stuff that the parole board uh, does now. I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I don't think we really thought of it that way, but that would make a lot of sense. So definitely something we should look into. Matt, what do you think? I mean, is that possible? Absolutely happy to, to work with you, Representative, uh, on what some of those details might look like. Terrific, thank you. Sounds like that's why we have HP2. Any other questions? I don't see any hands on the screen. Any questions in the chamber? Everybody all set? We'll work together on this, and I know it'll come out right. It always does. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate the time. And again, any questions you have, just you know, send them right along. Um, you know, we've we've. The good news is, that I've I've actually done this a couple of times now. I'm I'm getting much better at it. I I really do believe it's one of the best budgets we've ever put forth, given tough economic times, but huge opportunity going forward. And and we just got a great team here, so we'll work with you on any issue you want. And I just appreciate the time to to present it. And and I know whatever whatever turns out, it's going to be a great budget in the end. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. We'll see you. All right. Is is Matt going to follow you? I guess not. All right. I am here. All right. Matt is here. All right. Any further questions at this time for Matt or shall we get to him with the details later as we go through the budget? Any hands up on the committee that's remote? Any uh, questions in the chamber? All right, we'll get to work on this right away. Thank you all very much for coming and thank the LBA for uh, setting this up. And uh, we'll see you all the next few days as we dig into this. Thank you, Chairman.